The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to Hackett's Cove, Nova Scotia and Mottel's webinar on the VS series of intelligent transmitters. We're very glad you've joined us here on the, uh, the shores of St. Margaret's Bay. We've gotten a share of snow this week, but it's absolutely stunningly beautiful outside. Let me show you what we're going to try to do today. I'm Chuck Kelly, Director of Sales here at Nautel, and I have with me, I'm very pleased to have with me, Dave Duncan, who is a research engineer who focuses specifically on the software aspects of things and has been one of the prime movers behind the AUI control system of Nautel. Uh, the things we're going to talk about today um, are uh, the VS series concept. We're going to actually get inside a VS series of transmitters, the, the 300, the, the 1 kilowatt, and the 2.5 and the kilowatt, as well as the VSHD, and let you see the insides and show you what's inside one of these things. We're going to take you on a tour uh, and explain how the VS works in HD radio mode. We're going to go do a tour, a live tour, of, of a number of transmitters that we've got online and look at their AUI and walk through the menus. We're going to look at how to use the VS series as an exciter. If you've got a, a, an older transmitter and you want to upgrade the exciter, you know, how you can do that. We're going to talk about using the VS300 for LPFM use, particularly for the United States uh, LPFM, LPFM industry. We're going to talk about the VS as used in synchronous FM applications. And we're going to talk about the VS as it's used in push radio. And throughout all of it, we're going to give you an opportunity to ask questions. If you'll note on the right side of your screen, you should have a little GoToWebinar um, information there. You should be able to click on that and enter questions for us. And near the end of the webinar, we're going to read those questions, and Dave and I will do our very best to answer them. <laughs> I, have, I have been stumped in the past, and I expect to be stumped in the future, and that's okay. We'll get the answers and email them to you at a later date. Um, the main idea about the VS series is it's not just a simple low-power FM transmitter. A lot of low-power transmitters uh, are on the, on the market today, uh, low price, low power, small size. Uh, what we did, though, is give it the absolute ultimate of features, functionality, and performance. So the, it's a fully digital exciter with the performance of a fully digital exciter. It has our AUI control system, and we'll talk about that. It has unparalleled inputs uh, with it, 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 IP inputs. We can take live wire inputs. We can take shoutcast inputs. We can even play off of a USB memory device. Uh, it's capable of HD radio and DRM+. And as an option, you can actually put an Orban uh, audio processor inside and control it through the same interface as, as, the, um, as the AUI. Let's talk about the price, because in solid state, low power FM transmitters, that's often what most people are interested in. All of these features, all of this performance didn't impact the price. The VS300 is $5,000. Compare that to a typical, typical digital exciter in the industry. Uh, even today, you'll find a typical digital exciter is ten dollars to $15,000 by itself. The one kilowatt version is $8,000. Note that it does up to 1,400 watts. And the two and a half kilowatt version is only $15,000. So these are a, a, an amazing uh, combination of price uh, and performance at a value. Let's talk about that performance. All of these transmitters, the VS series, have no compromise in terms of audio performance. We're talking about six, a 90 dB signal-to-noise ratio in, in the mono or composite mode, 80 dB in stereo, uh, frequency response um, uh, absolutely flat, point, plus or minus 0 0.05 dB, um, THD 0.005% or less in mono, 0.025% or less in stereo, crosstalk 50 dB below 100%, you know, IMD, DIM, all of these numbers are among the best numbers you'll find in the industry anywhere. So there is no compromise in terms of audio performance in these series of transmitters. These transmitters can be upgraded to digital. So you can add the VSHD and uh, 
uh, you can add the HD capability to this. We've also done DRM plus on these transmitters. The VSHD also has that capability of adapting uh, DRM plus to make it work with the VS series. Uh, the VSHD is in a box not only the adaptive pre-correction type exciter, but it's also the XGen card in a box, and we'll see that. Um, it does not include the exporter or the importer. You would buy those separately, just as you would with anybody else's transmitter. And note that you can get HD Power Boost and reliable HD Transport as options for the VS series with the VSHD. And we'll go a, little, a bit more into the VSHD as we look inside the unit and also let you play with the controls. Main thing that people talk about with the VS series is the audio input choices that people have. Uh, you can feed this transmitter AES EBU. You can feed it left and right analog. You can feed it composite. You can feed it shoutcast. You can feed it live wire, and it can play from a USB port as well. And all of these, this is the back of the 300 watt transmitter, um, and all of these ports are available on the back of this this transmitter. You'll note here, this is the network port. So that's how you not only drive the AUI, but you also can feed in your shoutcast and live wire audio inputs as well. Okay. okay. Let's talk about live wire a bit. Live wire is a digital studio um, protocol which uses Cat5 cable to interface uh, various different uh, studio items. Uh, typically, and, and there's a wide range. It's, it's developed by a company called Axia, which, which is part of the Telos Omnia Axia group of companies. And there's a number of companies which have gotten on board with the live wire interface standard. And imagine being able to just wire your entire radio station with nothing but Cat5 cable. You can do that with live wire. And the VS series is the first transmitter in the world to actually incorporate a live wire node right inside the transmitter so that you can drive directly from the digital studio right into the transmitter with live wire. That was the, quite a feat. And we well, that was, yeah, that was, that was wonderful. I mean, uh, Axia provided us with uh, a software module which we were able to incorporate in our transmitters uh, and allowed us to pick up the live wire feed and uh, use that as an audio source. And what's really exciting about this is we are the only transmitter in the world that currently has this functionality. Um, and, and it even becomes more powerful when you consider the fact that we've integrated an audio processor right inside the transmitter as well. The transmitter also has a shoutcast input. Um, shoutcast is the standard that a lot of radio stations and, and, and web stations use for webcasting, streaming audio in real time over the over the internet, and Shoutcast currently has 47,000 plus stations on the internet doing this. And what the original concept of this uh, Dave was that was as, as an emergency backup. If your STL went down, but you still had uh, internet at the site, and and you didn't have audio input to the VSY, it could actually go out, find your Shoutcast site, yeah. bring that audio into the transmitter, and put it on the air. Right, and I mean the interesting thing is you could run your own Shoutcast server with your content. Exactly. And so you would maybe have a very short interruption, and then it would just pick up right again with the, uh, the internet, as long as that was still available. That's right, and so it has really two different purposes. One purpose is as an emergency backup audio source. Another purpose is, in some stations, they're actually using it as a nearly free STL with a high reliability IP path. So if you have a very good high reliability IP path um, internet, uh, well, you can you can actually run for free a, a Shoutcast server in your station. It's free downloadable software, and then you can just um, connect it up right. via IP addresses to the to the VS series, and it's a free STL at that point. Right, and we actually support uh, both methods. Um, one would be to receive a playlist from the internet, which is sort of typical for most online radio stations. Mm -hmm. Or we, we also support just uh, a stream coming from a single um, IP address, which might be your free server, standalone server that you're running at uh, your station. Now, there may be people who 
wrinkle their nose up at the concept of <laughs> using streaming audio on a radio station. And, and certainly there are lots of examples of, of streams with very low data rates and they're not very good attention to audio processing. But today it's possible to actually use some pretty reasonable data rates and get some pretty reasonable audio quality out of them. Certainly comparable at least to that of an analog STL. Yes. yes. Okay. Now let's talk about the internal USB player. <coughs> Originally the concept for this was that if all else failed, if you couldn't get audio to your transmitter, why wouldn't it be cool to take a little USB memory stick and stick it at the back of the transmitter, have it recognize it, find a collection of files, either linear or MP3, and, and, and play them off on some sort of playlist. Mm -hmm. And we implemented that as an emergency thing, but it got us to thinking that there may be people who would like to do this on a more regular basis. So there are people now who are taking and creating intentional playlists on these memory sticks because you could buy a memory stick very inexpensively these days. You have it staples and I, I've seen them as big as 256 gigabytes. Yeah. And there's also these little USB drives which are basically small network drives in a little box that have a USB right. cable on them and this works for that too. Yes, you can plug in a terabyte drive and you could easily store thousands of songs on there and just play them out. So one of the really cool things, and we're going to talk about it now, I believe. No, it's not, the, it's not the next page. So one of the really cool things that we can do is to, is to do automatic switchovers. We can say in the configuration of the transmitter, we can say there are, um, the audio is stopped and we need to, um, we need to switch to a different audio input. And so we'll, we'll show you how that functionality works, but you can imagine the flexibility that it gives you in your radio station because the transmitter can automatically provide silent sense detection and then make intelligent decisions as to what to do with that information once it has it. Right, and we can set up very complex chains of, of uh, audio loss situations that may go from screen to USB back to an AES input. Uh, and you know we, we can do a lot to uh, to make sure that there's always something on air. That's right. This transmitter works real hard to stay on air. Now let's talk about the Orban Inside. Orban Inside was a concept that we had where we we built and designed our own DSP card, which you can see here, and and then we licensed the code from Orban for the 5500 series processor, which is a five band or two band processor. And it is AES EBU in and out. And um, so therefore the stereo generation and, and limiting and all that stuff occurs in the, in the transmitter as opposed to the audio processor. But it means that all of the inputs that come into the transmitter, left and right analog, are digitized and presented to the Orban and AES EBU. We can, of course, bring in AES EBU, the live wire, job cache, the USB player inputs, all of those can be then processed by the Orban inside. Yes. Yeah. The only one that can't be is the composite input because we do not we do not demodulate a composite input and then reprocess it. Right. So that's understandable. The thing that's important here is that we are able, because it's just a simple board, we are able to produce and sell these Orban inside cards when installed in a VS transmitter for $1,200. It's a fraction of the price that you would pay for a processor that is this powerful. And you'll see the Orban inside operating today and you can see the functionality, the presets, all that sort of thing become very powerful. The key thing to understand though about why Nautel decided to take and do something completely different than has been done as far as I know of before is because when you have so many different types of audio inputs there's only one place to do the audio processing, and that's inside the transmitter. And that's why the Orban inside has to be inside. Let's talk about presets, because they're very powerful. You can have up to 50 sets of presets. And a preset is a combination of just about everything that you can configure for the transmitter. Right, Dave? Yeah, we have, uh, we've got everything in there, starting with the uh, frequency, the power level, and set the digital mode. We can adjust audio levels. We've even got we've got all of our audio loss tied in. 
uh, including all of our audio sources. Uh, and that means that we can use the preset to really control the transmitter at a very, uh, in a very complex way and, 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 and make sure that we've always got some audio flowing through the transmitter. We can set up these audio loss chains, which we mentioned before, and we can uh, control the audio, uh, the Orban processor presets as well within within our presets. Right. So One of the things that I find fascinating is a comment here about the N plus one. Um, if you think about an N plus one system where you have N transmitters, let's say N is five, so you have five different transmitters on the air, different frequencies, different audio contents, different formats, and you have one spare transmitter that automatically switches itself in place of one of those if, in case of a failure. Well, think about all the things that have to change. You have to change the audio input. You have to change the audio processing setups. You right. have to change the frequency and the audio sensitivity. All of these things are built right into the preset. So as far as getting the transmitter, oh, all the RDS settings, the SCA settings, all of those change automatically when you change that preset from one frequency to another. So it's a very, very powerful tool. So let's take a look. You know, we've done webinars before on the VS, but we never really got down inside the box and let you take a look at what's inside it. Just a couple of notes of things you should look for. Look at easy access to all the connectorized boards and assemblies. You know, the legendary Nautel conservative design. It's all built here in North America. It's not being shipped in from somewhere else. There are no potentiometers or trimmers in the entire design. Hallelujah. That's wonderful. <laughs> and it's totally broadband. There's no adjustments. In order to change frequency, you just do it in the AUI, make a preset change, and you've changed frequency. The fans are easily removable, and the air filter is washable. So these are very uh, robust transmitters. Let's look inside. This is the VS300. The back panel you can see here is on the left side, and the front panel is on the right side. And there's a little LCD display there that allows you to do a lot of cool things. Looking inside the transmitter, here is the exciter and the controller card. This is where all of the brains is occurring, and right. all the connectors are peeking right through the back panel of the transmitter. This is the main power supply, and there's two other power supplies that are used for different voltages. There's an IPA here. The PA amplifier stage is right there. And this is the output filter. And then there's a reflectometer here going to, uh, going to the output connector back here. There's one cooling fan here, and then there's another cooling fan inside, if I, I believe, inside the power supply. Um, what's interesting about the, the, the location of the cooling fan here is that it is actually blowing most of its air through a channel heat sink. So if you were to look at that, it looks like it's blowing to the underneath of those PC cards, and indeed it is, because the, the heat sinks that are underneath these cards are where the air is passing primarily over, which is where the cooling needs to be done. And uh, we actually have uh, the, uh, in the card here where we have our exciter, we've actually integrated everything together. We've integrated our ARM processor, which does which delivers the, uh, the AUI and yep. the exciter together. Yep. Uh, and if you were to buy the Orban upgrade, which we'll see later, it you just plug right in here. Lay right on top. That's right. The other thing that and you just mentioned, the ARM processor. The ARM processor is the, is the controller that where the AUI, the control system, runs, and the, uh, the audio player is running in the ARM processor, all of these things. But what you don't see here is a computer. Right. There is no computer. There is no hard drive. Yeah. There is no moving parts. Everything is solid state. There's no Windows screen of death <laughs> in one of these That's things. Right. It's it's all an integrated processor with hard hard code. It's all embedded and it's designed to be extremely reliable. And we have uh, you know we have watchdogs and all kinds of systems set up to monitor the processes that are happening and if anything should go wrong they're immediately rebooted and mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that you always have access to that remote interface. Good. All right, so now this is the VS1, the one kilowatt transmitter. <coughs> and again, the rear panel is on the left. There's the ex digital exciter card with the controller. Here's the main power supply. And we'll see that this transmitter is actually on two sides. So we'll flip it over here in a second. But right now you can see that there are these fans in, a, in, a, in an assembly here. 
And that assembly actually pulls out uh, very easily from the top side, the other side. We're looking at the bottom at the moment. And so there's those same fans right there. And you can just pull them straight out the top. They have connectors on them. One thing you can note here is that you can see that there's three wires on every one of those fans. And that's because every one of them has a tachometer built into it. And Dave's software is monitoring the RPMs of every one of those uh, every one of those fans, and you can see that in the AUI. Now, looking at the business side of things here, we have the IPA here, and we have four PA amplifiers, individual cards that are right there. And then this is the combiner uh, over here, and the low pass filter is down underneath here as well. And there's another power supply here, a low power, or a low voltage power supply. So that's the configuration and design. You can see how open and easy uh, and robust this this unit is. This is now the big boy. This is the VS2.5. Again, we're looking at the bottom side. The exciter card is here. And you can see the, uh, the rear panel is over here. Now we have three big power supplies inside, even though only two was actually right. required for this design. We've added an extra one for robustness and reliability. You can see the cooling fans there, another power supply. Flip it over. These are the output amplifiers. Now you'll notice that they look a little different than the ones that are inside the VS300 and the VS1. And that's because in the 2.5 kilowatt transmitter, we decided to employ LDMOS power amplifiers. Um, they're, they're capable of twice the amount of power, so therefore we only need four of those uh, to, to get the job done um, uh, at the 2.5 kilowatt level all the way up to 2.8 kilowatt. Again, you can see the bank of, of fans here blowing through the heat sink channel. Those fans, again, can be pulled out directly from the top very quickly. You can see the output network over here. You can see the reflectometer system here. So it's a very uh, uh, clean, easy design to, to, to see and to work with. And this is the inside of the VSHD. This actually is the same card that is used in the NV series of transmitters as an exciter. Right, the SCNAP86. That's right. And, and so it has the capability, I think it, this is the connector over here, right in there somewhere, which is for the adaptive pre-correction. So it samples the output of the transmitter, brings it back in, does adaptive pre-correction, which adds immeasurably to the linearity of the transmitter. Right. Yes. The uh, the and and this this uh, control card here will actually take over a lot of the functionality when you add the HD and mm -hmm. uh, and drive the transmitter right from this box. Okay. And this VSHD is the add-on box that makes any of the VS transmitters compatible with HD. This other board you're seeing right here is the XGen card. So that's actually located inside the VSHD. And so what happens is you bring low-powered RF from this device right into the VS transmitter. There's a jack on the back of the transmitter, and it, it replaces the RF coming from the local exciter. Okay, so let's talk about, well, actually, let's switch over and take a look at some of the screens. All right, let's take a look at some of these AUI screens. Dave's been looking forward to showing off these <laughs> screens, so we'll, we'll do that now. Okay, so this, I believe, Dave, is a two and a half kilowatt, a VS two and a half that's over in our engineering lab. It's currently running at 99.9 .9 megahertz, and we've got it up to 80 watts only because we don't want to warm it up too much over there in the yeah, lab. Those, those poor fellows over there, we don't want to roast them out. That's right. So um, tell us what you're seeing here on the screen, Dave. Tell me your concept of the AUI. So uh, essentially what, what we like to what we like to show is we like to show a sort of a we have this idea of a top and a bottom banner. So at the top we can we like to show sort of the critical information that that, that anybody would like to normally know about. Power level, computer. reflected power, That's frequency right. mode. Yeah. All of our settings, make sure we've got some modulation there, uh, show which exciter we're using and the preset date. is set up here. Nice yeah, know. nice to the date, yeah. Very um, expensive uh, clock and calendar. <laughs> <That's Yeah. right. laughs> and uh, and then in the center we like we show um, this is sort of our what we call our home screen. Uh, in the center, we've got four tools, and uh, and these tools, uh, some of them are useful for setup, and then others are, are sort of more useful for general operation. So obviously, uh, a spectrum. This is a spectrum analyzer, an RF spectrum analyzer, 
Now in the two and a half, without doing HD, it's, it's not actually looking at the output of the transmitter. It's actually looking at what's going on in the DSP uh, RF generation. Right. Right. So, but it's still very accurate in terms of it's what your accurate, signal looks right. like. And, and one of the things that I like to do is I like to, to uh, expand well, it up. It's make actually it nice both. because it's showing you exactly what the exciter is producing. Exactly. So there's no question as to what other effects might be happening on the signal once before it gets out. Now this is a laboratory grade spectrum right. analyzer. You can sit there and it's got the marker and you can take a look at that and, and you can adjust the marker frequency and, and look look see everything that's going on. Also, the other thing I really love about this is you can come in here and you can change it from an RF spectrum analyzer to a composite baseband spectrum analyzer. So now we can see the 0 to 100 kilohertz range, and we can, as it begins to average out here, you can see, let's see here, this is, this is 20 kilohertz, is that right, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, well, it's not so simple in this particular case. So this is the 38 kilohertz double sideband suppressed carrier for the L minus R, that's the 19 kilohertz. And we're not running anything in SCA or RDS at the moment, so those are it's going to continue to average and come down. But that is very functional. If I were to go in, let's just for grims, let's just go ahead and turn on RDS. So I'll go into the presets, and I'll turn on RDS, and I'll make it 57 kilohertz, which is standard, and we'll just hit apply, and then we'll come over here and look back at that screen, and now we can yeah. see the RDS is there in the double side then, or in, in, in the uh, 57 kilohertz carrier frequency there. So the RDS, you can see it right away. I could add the SCAs, and it would, it would represent them as well. Now, the other thing we can do is we can take out one of the instruments and replace it with something else. Right. So, go ahead. Um, and, and Again, like I said, some of these, like the uh, frequency response, the impulse response, the filter delay, those those are generally more useful for setting up the transmitter, and they can mm -hmm. save you a lot of time uh, and effort, uh, where you don't have to bring in external equipment to show you these things. Okay. And um, uh, and then you know, so and you can actually uh, now with the HD box, we would actually add a few more to show sure. you some. Some extra and we'll show we'll demonstrate that, that here in a second. Later. My favorite meter up here, by the way, is the Lissajou, um, and the Lissajou actually shows the complex relationship between the left and the right audio channels. So you see the amplitude as well as the phase relationship between them. So at one look, you know, I see a fuzzy ball here going generally in the lower left upper right, right. configuration. That means things are in phase, and I have some good stereo content. If it was a flat line going this way, that means I've got plenty of R and no L, and right. vice versa the other way. And we can tell by the general size whether or not we're uh, modulating, modulating appropriately. So with one glance across the room in your transmitter room or, or your desktop, for instance, you can see where the status of your, your, your outgoing audio is. Now let's talk about the meters over here, Dave. We've thrown some meters up here, for example. But we can take and choose just about anything we would want to, right? That's right. We can pick and choose any of the meters that would uh, would be available on any of the devices within the transmitter, and we can pull those up on the uh, the right hand side. And you know, depending on the task that you're doing, you can customize those meters there for whatever you'd like to see, whatever okay. you're interested in. One of my favorite things here is to take a look at clicking one of these buttons, and now when I do that, I see the status of everything going on in the in the controller at, in, in, instantly, right. and, and they're all being updated in real time. And this is great when, you know, sometimes you, you just want to be able to see everything all at once. Uh, and we find that technicians actually use this a lot, mm -hmm. uh, and is one of the reasons why we included it, uh, because they said, you know, we really want to see everything at some times. And this is a value of the, the whole AUI concept, the controller concept, is that the the Customer service engineers at Nautel, if you're having a problem, you can call us up, let, give us access to your AUI, and, and we can look over your shoulder and see right. everything that's going on inside the transmitter and help you troubleshoot it very quickly. Help you understand yeah, what the issues might be and where to look next. Okay. So now let's talk about 
I'll close that. Let's talk, let's go through those presets we were talking about before, how powerful those presets are. Um, the general preset here we're talking about, or the general tab, allows us to adjust the output power, the frequency, and the mode of operation. That's right. Now, uh, the mode of operation and some of the options and fields that are available will actually change depending on how the transmitter is configured. Yeah, by plugging in a VSHD, that's right. Yeah, it'll, it'll give me those options. Or what have you. Okay, under main audio, right now our audio source is what we call secondary digital, but our other choices are left, right, or multiplex or composite, primary digital, which would be AES EDU, or secondary digital, which means either the IP or the memory stick. Right. Okay. Our internal uh, audio system. Right. And here I can set the digital level that represents full scale on the transmitter or 100% yes. modulation. I can change my audio mode to mono L plus R, L, R, or stereo. I can turn on or off or 15 kilohertz low pass filter. I can change my pre-emphasis to any of the standards that are used in the world. And here's a new one. For those of you who have VFS units, this one, this one is going to look new to you. This is a new yeah. software version that, um, and before somebody asks, you can have about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but this is the audio modulation adjustment. Can you explain that, Dave? Okay. Well, let's let's. I believe what this means is that it is the yeah, particularly important when you have the audio processor, when you have the Orban inside, right. because this adjusts the level uh, uh, of the of the transfer. I can add or subtract gain from the output of the audio processor, and that allows it me to adjust. Once I've got the processor set up properly, I can add or subtract gain at that. Right, with that. Our, our digital level was didn't quite fit the bill for that particular right. setting, and so we needed something that uh, is a little bit more accurate. Now here I'm choosing which shout, uh, you know, I can have local playlists, I can have different shoutcast configurations. We'll show you where you can figure that up. Here's the SCAs. I've got two internal SCAs, or I can bring in an external SCA. Um, I can also set up the RDS. Uh, I showed that a bit before, but I, I, it's important that everybody understand the depth of information. This is not only static RDS, it's also got the capability for doing the dynamic RDS. And that means that you can feed in, for instance, song title and artist information into the transmitter, either via ASCII or UECP uh, through an RS-232 right. port, or directly to a port on the Ethernet connection. That's right. So you can actually stream this directly to the transmitter, and it will pick it up and uh, display it over RDS for you. And all the other settings that you need for RDS are all built into the VS here as well. So we can do all the, uh, uh, the various features that are required. There's a place to put your alternate frequency table, and, and all that's built in. Now then, at the end, there's a one called Other Audio. It's rather innocuous, but it's very, very powerful. There's a lot of information here. It's where we set the pilot level. The transmitter also has the capability of having its audio and pilot and carrier frequency all synchronized with 10 megahertz and 1 PPS for use in a synchronous FM system. And so here is where you would turn on or off the 1 PPS sync, and it also has a built-in audio delay unit, which you can adjust in increments of one microsecond, which mm -hmm. is perfect for, for, um, for uh, uh, synchronous FM, SFM systems. Um, now, this is what we were talking about when we, we talked about being able to fail over to another right. preset. Yeah, these so are our audio loss chains. This says audio loss timeout. If we, if we choose yes, then we say, well, what do we want to do as a result of that? Well, we want to change the preset, okay? And what preset do we want to change to? Well, we'll change to the AES input in this particular case. But any of the presets that we right. configured show up there in the scroll bar. That's right. What defines a an audio loss? It's X number of minutes, X number of seconds at a threshold of 25% in this case or less. Right. So you so can define know. what defines a what, what defines a playlist or a, 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 a audio loss timeout. And and the nice thing here is is that if, if we look down just a little bit further. Um, sorry, if, if this system was, was connected to an Orban audio processor, right. you can actually select the Orban audio processor preset that is associated with 
this particular preset. So That's when right. you do a changeover and you change to a different stream, if you would like to use a different process, different processing on it, it will do that. That's so right. It will change that. And we'll show that on the on the yeah. organ inside uh, transmitter in just a second. We also have a number of, of simple audio processor functions that are built standard into the transmitter. Um, which allow people to do that final little bit of limiting at the transmitter, for instance, um, uh, should they need to. It also has a very important limiter, which is called a multiplex power limiter. This is a very specific kind of limiter that's required uh, by the laws in the European community. And so this, uh, this turns on what's called a multiplex power limiter, and which limits the amount of power that goes into the multiplex sidebands. Uh, of the transmitter. One thing to mention here, when we talk about um, uh, making changes and, and creating new pre presets, this is how you can create new presets because you can enter a name here and save it as, in essence. Right. And, and, and this way you can get up to 50 or more presets. Right. Yeah, well, 50 plus presets. It's, uh, it's a staggering number and you can imagine how much you can accomplish with that with the uh, given the audio loss uh, abilities and oh well, yeah now I want to I want to cover a couple more things before we get out of the menus and move on to a different transmitter here because I've got two other transmitters to show one of them I want to show you is the software configuration because in the software configuration you've made some changes one of them is this port number this allows the transmitter to have a different port than just port 80 for instance. Well, actually, we've, got, we've typically had uh, three ports with our software, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of uh, a lot of you may already be familiar with them. One of them was 80, which which allowed you to run the remote AUI interface, and then mm -hmm. we had another port dedicated to transferring information back and forth between the transmitter and the AUI, and then and then we had sort of an innocuous 843, which was a security port, and. So what we've done with this new version is we've, first of all, we've eliminated the, uh, the security port. We no longer need that. We only have the two now. So, and we can move the port 80 for the AUI. We can, we were already able to move that, but now we can actually move the server port as well. And that means that um, you can finally start talking to more than one transmitter within your networks. Mm -hmm. And so... So if you have a router and you've got multiple VLCs right. that are racked, you can configure the router to point at different ports. That's right. You can, That's excellent. And, and now you can actually look at all of them at the same time. Okay. Which is, which is great. Now, the VS is a software-driven product, and the capability exists for you to upgrade software. What's the problem? How do you go about doing a, a software upgrade? So typically, um, we, can, we can do a software upgrade um, or a software installation uh, through two methods now. Um, before we weren't able to do it over USB, but now we can actually load the TGZ file uh, onto a USB drive and we can connect that to the transmitter and select it as an upgrade file okay. and begin that process. Um, or we can upload it through the web and select it here on this upgrade software page. And it's very simple. You just Once it's on the transmitter, we just select it here and we press start and we just wait for, for everything to happen. And, um, it will let you know when it's done. Okay. Under email configuration, there's also um, a late Christmas present for a lot That's of right. people. A lot of you have been asking for uh, the ability to talk to authenticated servers. Um, and so we're happy that we could finally do that. Uh, so we now support clear text authentication for SMTP servers. And that should uh, make it a lot easier to get email support for the transmitter. Um, and that's important because everybody likes to get notifications about the health of their uh, transmitter. Absolutely. Okay, and we also I want to show here the audio player because this is so critical to so many functions of this. We don't have a USB in here at the moment, so therefore there's no playlist, right? Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Maybe yep. one of I think one of the other ones may. Okay, we'll look when we get over there. But we do have some configured screen streams some uh, shoutcast, we could have added a live wire here. That's right. Um, and if we had a USB stick in here, you'd see files here, and then we could create a playlist from those files. Right. Um, okay, so I want to go to the next transmitter real quick. And this is a VS1, which is operating at the moment at 101.5 megahertz at 32 watts of forward power. And right away, you see one big difference here is this audio processor screen is dynamically showing levels and things. 
That's the Orban inside. So this unit actually has the Orban inside resident. And if I were to bring up the menu, you'll notice that I have a new menu choice, and that is the Orban inside menu. So I can click on that, and now what I've got is I can see all of the normal tabs. If you're familiar with the Orban inside um, or the Orban uh, configuration of the 5500, which is the most similar processor to this one, um, you'll see the same kinds of commands here that you would see um, uh, on the remote right. software. Yeah, we want to try and keep it as similar as possible in terms of layout and and uh, naming conventions and, and headings so that you're not lost when you look at this screen and don't understand, you know, if, you know, if you've been using an Orban processor in the past, this should feel like any other Orban processor. One of the things that I like a lot is the ability to bring up that menu that we saw on the front panel and bring it up here and just put it anywhere on the screen we want. And that way, while we're making adjustments, we can see the effect those adjustments have on the meters in real time. Okay, so that's the Orban Inside. Note that the Orban Inside does support all the same normal presets that you would have with the 5500 series. So if I want to load presets, here's all of the familiar presets that you would normally have. So not only can you then implement those, right. but you can also modify them. Yeah. And save and them to the system. The interface is the same as uh, the Orban 5500. Um, you have factory presets, and then it also supports a number of user presets, and uh, and and the modif uh, as well, which mm -hmm. everybody is familiar with. Mm -hmm. So uh, these this particular transmitter uh, probably doesn't have any user presets, but we can see that it's a factory preset by the F, yep. which indicates that it's factory, yep. and any user presets would be marked with a U. Right. And the uh, the modif and you can't preset, change the factory presets. No, you can never change the factory presets, and the modif preset would always be indicated with a star. Okay, all right. Now, one other thing that have it, having the Orban inside changes is it changes one of the other menus, where I can go up here to the preset menu, and I can see that in the settings of the preset menu, if I bring that up. And click on other audio, if I remember correctly. That's right. So the Orban processor is now showing up on the menu, and the, the preset is chosen there as well. This allows this, this automatic switching of the presets to also control the Orban processor. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, the, the key here is that suppose in that N plus 1 situation we were talking about, where we had five different frequencies, five different stations operating, and, and the and, uh, VS was being used as the backup transmitter for one of those. When you switch the frequency, when you switch the audio input, it automatically switches the audio processing. Because certainly you want to process a classical station differently than you want to process a rock station, for instance. Or talk, for that matter. Exactly. Okay, so let's continue on, and I want to show you, this is a one kilowatt VS transmitter with the VS HD installed. So this transmitter is actually operating in HD mode. You can see the iBox sidebands here. You can see how clean this transmitter is and how much we're maybe hitting or uh, clearing the mask by. Of course, we're only operating at 50 watts out of the kilowatt, but, but still, it's a very, very clean transmitter. And we can put that back into place. And the thing here to see is that we also have, under hardware configuration, new menus which are available which allow you to set up the, the uh, XGen card that is located within the VSHD. Right. So you have uh, lookup table storage information, XGen interface information, iBox settings, all conveniently within the, the same the AUI. AUI. Right. And, uh, and we do actually have a few new tools as well to help you manage right. the uh, HD box. Right. So Those are the, the screens. So these are, in essence, the screens that you would see in the MD series today right. because it's the same card as in the MD series. Yeah. Yep, okay. Good. All right. So those are the things that we wanted to talk about. Uh, let me go ahead and fill that up with something. And now let's switch back and uh, 
pretty soon we're going to be getting to your questions. If you haven't sent in a question yet, please do, and uh, we will be answering those very soon. So the last couple of screens we wanted to talk about here is uh, talking about the VS series as an exciter replacement. Uh, with the VS300 being just $5,000, it's an incredible value for replacement as a fully digital exciter with all the features. Uh, at $8,000, the VS1 provides the same functionality, but in many cases can also replace the IPA as well. All of the VS series transmitters include a DC block and a DC short at the output, which eliminates string or, or grid shorts in the transmitter, two-pack transmitter, from damaging the VS power amplifier. And the, the transmitter can also provide the contact closures for PLL lock and input control for exciter mute signals that older transmitters typically require. So it's very easy to interface a VS series transmitter as an exciter replacement and very cost effective. Next. Why is this not moving? I'll do it this way. Okay. As an LPFM transmitter, in the United States, transmitters must be certified for LPFM use. We have now applied for the LPFM certification because a lot of our customers want us to, and, it, and, and we expect to be able to offer LPFM certified transmitters soon. I'm talking about a few months. The LPFM model will be limited to 100 watt capability, which is required of the FCC rules, and will have a special label showing that it is certified under the FCC rules. If you have more questions, about LPFM, this is the FCC website uh, that you can go to and get detailed information about LPFM uh, transmitters. Let's talk about the VS as a synchronous booster. I showed the screens, but just to, to explain how you might do it, this is a synchronous FM where you have two stations with exactly the same content on exactly the same frequency with overlapping coverage. And the idea here is to minimize the amount of of uh, distortion in the overlap zone, in the interference zone. In order to do that, you have to synchronize every aspect of, of both transmitter signals. And in order to do that, we provide uh, the GPS inputs for 10 megahertz and one pulse per second to synchronize the carrier and the stereo pilot, and not just the frequency of the stereo pilot, but also the phase of the stereo pilot. And there's also, because it's a fully digital exciter, we can set the gain very exactly, so the gain of the two transmitters will be exactly the same. And then as, as we, do, we showed on another screen, you can also uh, look at the built-in, or, or adjust the built-in audio delay system, so that in the interference zone, the audio is synchronized to that site. You can minimize the effects of the interference to, in essence, multipath. Push radio is a concept, and we, we did a webinar just recently about it. If you'd like to learn more, uh, go, to web, uh, go to our webinar page and pull down the one we did a couple of weeks ago. But it, it's an idea where people actually use the IP uh, connectivity of the transmitter and store content on the memory stick locally, and then dynamically adjust the playlist remotely so that they can actually do the play out of the audio from the transmitter. Tons of benefits to doing this, particularly if you're a network station where you may have tens or hundreds of stations over a wide area. You can use the internet as a high reliability file transfer, file transfer medium as opposed to a relatively low reliability uh, real-time audio transfer medium. And there's a lot of work that's going on in this right now. Dave spends a lot of his time <laughs> as, we, as we continue to enhance the functionality of the VS to make push radio even more uh, effective. Trying to improve our ability to handle the playlists and push new content to the transmitters. It's very exciting for us, and we're uh, looking forward to showing more. The, the transmitter, the back side of the transmitter, do a little pun, on, uh, little pun <laughs> here, but... But uh, the transmitter is plug and play, connected with as little as AC, an RF feed line, IP, or USB stick, and you're on the air. Uh, the external exciter input, as we mentioned, to, to provide the capability the VSHD going in is provided. And rack rails are included for sliding this thing out of the rack, and it makes it very convenient in all the models. So this is the chance we have now to see what you all have contributed in terms of questions, and we will now 
do our best to answer those questions. If I can start to see them here. Hold on a second. All right, looks like we've got quite a few. All right, and we'll be able to save the meter so if we log out and come back, they'll be the same. Well, uh, this, is, this is a feature that we have talked about internally quite a bit. Um, we haven't implemented it yet, uh, but it's certainly something that we are thinking about. And uh, it's, There's an interesting point about it, and, and, and it, 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 that makes it difficult, and it's the reason why they aren't that way today. And that is, I could log in to a VS unit mm -hmm. from my home, and I could, the general manager could log in Right. to the same VS unit from his home and have a completely separate screen. In other words, my mouse and his mouse aren't right. conflicting. Yeah. It's a completely separate screen and our own different sets of meters. And so the, the difficulty in saving things is is you have to tie it back to who you logged in as. Right, yeah. We have to manage multiple users on multiple lists. And uh, so far that hasn't, uh, hasn't been implemented. We have a comment here from uh, Mike. And he says, I have a VS1 and love it. Great transmitter. I received it in November 2010. When is this software version going to be available? A uh -huh. oh, couple of weeks. Mike. Yeah, we should be, uh, weeks. We should just, be ready. Uh, we just finished up uh, another round of testing, and we're uh, almost ready to go here. OK. It says, uh, what kind of AC, this is another question from Lloyd. It says, what kind of AC line surge suppression and grounding considerations come into play with these transmitters? All of the transmitters have um, your, your typical um, uh, surge suppression devices uh, in the AC part of it. Um, certainly, I always recommend having a site type of AC surge suppressor, typically very near where the, not only the AC entrance to the building is, but also to where the ground, the main ground point is for the, or, for the, uh, for the building. Um, Yes, the, the surge suppressors in the transmitter can work, but if you get a good good sized bolt, they're, they're going to blow up and sacrifice themselves, hopefully, and save the transmitter. There is also, as I mentioned, DC shorts in the antenna circuit, which will help to protect the, the, uh, the transmitter for the RF amplifier from being uh, affected by a, a lightning strike. But as always, the, the concept in terms of lightning protection is to make sure that if you think about your, if you think like a lightning bolt and you're hovering over your transmitter site, um, try to think about ways to make sure that the quickest path to the ground for that lightning is not through your transmitter. If you can do that, you will, you will oftentimes protect the transmitter very well. Uh, are these transmitter prices listed in the presentation retail? Yes, they are. And you can, uh, you can talk to your representative um, about what your your price may be, which includes freight and and uh, and other things. But yes, the, the prices are all list prices. And those are the questions that we've had today. Um, if you have additional questions, uh, please feel free to uh, to contact us by the email addresses uh, or contact your representative from Nautel. Um, there are additional places that you can go to get more information as well. The Nautel Waves newsletter is a, is a wonderful tool. We're getting a lot of positive feedback about that. You can click on this link to get uh, signed up for the Nautel Waves newsletter. You can find a, a rep, uh, rep, uh, repository of past webinars at uh, this address as well as sign up for future webinars. And there's a surprisingly large number of videos up on YouTube. Um, join our, our YouTube page as uh, Nautel Limited, and then also check our Nautel store. The, you can actually buy these VS transmitters right in the Nautel store over the web, uh, as well as access, I forgot how many thousands, tens of thousands of parts which are available there as well. So do, um, do avail yourself of those. Um, and if there are further questions, we're ready to help use these email addresses this is the crack sales team that we have ready to help you. And uh, we are uh, very proud uh, to be able to work uh, with these uh, people and these products and to work with you as our customers. And we thank you so much for joining us today and uh, we look forward to your questions. Thanks very much and goodbye from Hackett's Go. Bye-bye.